Hello and welcome to the Scuttlebutt Podcast. I'm your host, Brock Briggs, and each week I bring a conversation with a current or former service member to see what we can learn from them. We try to learn from today's and history's greatest vets on this show. Today I am happy to host a the first return guest, Bill Toady. Bill is the former captain of the USS Indianapolis, the author of From CEO to CEO, a great book on military transition to industry, as well as a variety of other titles. And Bill is joining us today to talk about Israel and Hamas. Bill, I appreciate you joining me. Happy to be here, Brock. I think that it would be helpful to set the stage for this conversation and just get down to the grassroots of exactly why and what is going on over in Israel. Uh, A few weeks ago, probably pushing a month ago now, was the first attack. And there's been a lot of different things unfolding since then, which we're going to get into. I'd like to maybe start with why exactly these two groups are at odds and maybe give us some of the lay of the land as to why this is important to the U.S. and the world. Now, the conflict actually started in relatively recent times. The, and the, so there's a lot of people deluded by perverted history. And while I had no dog in the fight until I started being asked to do some analysis on News Nation TV, the, it is important to understand the history because folks are using snippets of incorrect history to justify their positions. And that adds to the anger and extreme positions and adds, it's a, we, we call heat and no light. The, the matter actually goes back to the Roman days. When the region was first called Palestine, actually in Latin, Palestina, before that was mostly populated by Jews. Um, There were different kingdoms, the kingdom of Galilee, the kingdom, of course, of Judea. There were the Israeli Israelites or Israeli people that populated that area, very famous from biblical, historical and non-biblical secular context. It goes into great detail. And the population of Arabic people, remember the Muslim religion didn't start until hundreds of years later. The population of Arabic um, people was generally on the other side of the Jordan River, the area that in the 20th century was called the Transjordan. And the point is that, yes, people will point to the fact that this area has been called Palestine since the Roman days, which is true. But it wasn't called Palestine because there are Palestinian people living there. It was actually wasn't called Palestine until after the Romans, who feared both Jew, Jew, Jewish uprising and decades later Christian uprising, wanted to minimize the prevalence or prominence of Jewish people in the region. And they named it Palestina in order to de-emphasize the Jewish population in the region and, and emphasize the fact that it was folded into the Roman Empire with Roman names. It was already the Roman city of Caesarea in the region, even when it was, even when it was Galilee and the kingdom of Galilee and kingdom of Judea. And so the Romans were there for hundreds of years, as, as I think we know. The, the Arab, or I should say Muslim Jewish conflict did not manifest for a millennia. Over centuries, Jews began this diaspora. They began to migrate to other parts of the world. And that continued through the 20th century when the diaspora started to re-aggregate in the land that was called Palestine by the British, not by the, the Palestinians or anybody like that. And so let's go back to that. If there are, are any actual colonists in this region, those colonists would be the British Empire in the 17th and 18th centuries. The British conquered these, all of these regions, a lot of Africa, and as we know, the area that is Transjordan was British territory, the area that was you know, called you know, different names over different times, but it was Palestine by the British people. Not, and in fact, the, the name of Palestine is what gave name to the Arab Muslims that were in the region, not the other way around. It wasn't the Palestinians who gave name to the land because the land and name Palestina, Palestina 
predates the Muslim religion and the uh, Arabic people who live in the region. So people have that bit of history backwards. And that's important because there's a lot of emotion tied up around that name and the aspect of the word colonists. As I said, the Jewish people in this diaspora were largely, and I say this as a Christian, were largely sub subjugated by all of the nations that they populated. They were always seen as foreigners, migrants, interlopers. It didn't matter if it was Russia or Ukraine or the, the Baltics or the other European nations. The Jews were always considered non-nationals. Sometimes they performed extremely well and, and integrated into the community extremely well and were very successful and things like that. Sometimes they weren't living in ghettos and, and kind of not integrated into the populations in Italy and Greece and places like that. As the world knows, this, sub this horrible treatment peaked at the time of the Nazis. That is a time where the kind of pockets of mistreatment and pogroms was nationalized into national industrial policy to eliminate the Jewish people and the Nazis. And the, whereas a lot of countries gave the Jewish people lip service, but just treated them badly in Nazi Germany became national policy to proclaim that the Jews were subhuman and should be eliminated, which is shocking to me because again, as somebody who was born in the 1950s, I never thought I would see this level of rhetoric emerge in the world again. I thought that the world learned its lesson in the 1940s, 1930s, 1940s during the Nazi tenure, but it's emerging in the United States as well as other nations in ways that no, I certainly could not have predicted. And it's egregious and, and it needs to be stopped because it is pro-terrorist rhetoric that we're seeing emerge in the United States again. And so that kind of brings us to the current conflict. But let me set the stage on how the nation of Israel was formed. Post-World War II, after the world realized that 6 million Jews had been exterminated by Nazi Germany, there was a global movement to say, you know what, maybe the Jews do need a place where they're safe. Because clearly, this history can repeat itself. What can we do? And the Brits, who owned the region that was, it used to be Israel, and was now called Palestine, still had a mixture of Jewish and, and um, Muslim Arabs located, living there. The Britain said, we're happy to trans transfer this over back to form an Israeli state. This is in the mid 1940s, late 1940s. And the United Nations, newly formed United Nations agreed um, that there should be an establishment of an Israeli state, and accepted the offer of the British land, the British mandates, as they were called prior to World War II, and, and then established this state. And initially, even from the 1940s, you know, wanted to form a two-state solution, one for the Israelis, for the Jews, and one for the Muslim Palis Palestinians. And starting from the beginning, from the 1940s, the two-state solution was at times ex always accepted by the Jewish people, but at times accepted tentatively and then not accepted, not accepted by the Palestinians who thought, wait a minute, why should we give up any land at all? We've been living here for centuries. The fact is that so had the Jews. Actually, the Jews have been le living there for millennia, not centuries, thousands of years, not hundreds of years. And so no, this was a situation where it, it was very difficult to make both parties happy. And so there were tenuous agreements and Presidents over the course of the decades through Clinton tried to get the Palestinians to have Jimmy Carter with Menachem Begin and the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, and then later Clinton all tried to get the parties to come together and an agreement. Most recently, the Abraham Accords, 
and it never seemed to stick. Uh, even when different partners agreed that we we're going to start working cooperatively towards a solution, something would happen to cause it to fall apart. And that something was almost always on the Palestinian side. It's just a fact, okay? It's just a fact. And of course, the stuff hit the fan in 2006 when out of frustration of Palestinian people themselves in Gaza elected Hamas, a terrorist organization whose charter vows to eliminate the state of Israel and kill all the Jews, when the Palestinian people in Gaza, not on the West Bank, but in Gaza, uh, elected Hamas as their duly elected leadership. And so from that point on, there was no peace. There was no possible peace. The Abraham Accords, of course, was to try to bring Saudi Arabia into the process as the home of Mecca and the home of Muhammad and try to use the Saudis as brokers for peace with the Palestinians. And of course, as, as it's been clearly articulated since October 7th, of course, Iran could not live with that. Iran could not live with an emergent Saudi Arabia as the prime representative of the Muslim people. And so Iran used this moment as the Abraham Accords were coming to closure to initiate the coordinated attack, and it is a coordinated attack, uh, using their proxies, Hamas and potentially Hezbollah, and of course, Islamic State in, in Iran, Iraq and Syria, uh, to, to initiate a coordinated attack to stop the process once and for all. That is a long introduction, Brock. I apologize for that, but when you get me going, it's, it's hard to stop. No, it, it's really great. And I, most of that I didn't know. And so I appreciate the kind of stage setting because it's a lot of these conflicts are conflict in the Middle East. This, every single conflict in history has got roots that go back. It, it, there isn't just one shot fired and all of a sudden we're ready to go. There's, this has been brewing for a while. And I think that a lot of the things that you talked about alluded to that. At what point does the U.S. feel that we are tied to Israel? Is that we're obviously today one of their biggest fans and jumping up and down to support this movement? And I'm drawing a line between like military action and the sentiment amongst some people within the United States. However, that's we've been part of Israel or on the same side as Israel for a while. So is that, is World War II the start of when we, I don't know, make friends with Israel and feel tied to their success? Of course, Israel didn't exist during World War II. Prior to World War II, when, with the emergence of the Nazi party, Jews in Germany understood that they probably were not safe. And that's when a mass migration of Jews out of Germany into other countries, most prominently the United States began. And Jews from Russia, Ukraine, other places in the world, right? The, 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 the Tsarist Russia were initiated pogroms in the, the old pre-Soviet state that continued through the Soviet state. So the pogroms against Jews caused migration of Jews from Russia, from Ukraine, from the Baltics, into the United States, that accelerated with Nazi Germany, where Jews came out of Germany into the United States. So there was a large migration of Jews from Europe throughout the 20th century. Post-World War II, after the United States, after good Americans understood that the, something needed to be done to protect the Jews, to keep this kind of thing, six main Jews being exterminated from happening again. Kind-hearted Americans supported the establishment of the state of Israel as a way to ex protect Jewish populations. I wish I could tell you that 100% of the motivation in America for establishment of the Jewish state was kind-hearted. It wasn't all altruistic. There was another anti-Semitic population in America that saw the establishment of the Jewish state in Israel as a way to stifle or terminate 
the migration of Jews from Europe to America. In other words, if there's a Jewish state, Israel, maybe the Jews will stop coming here and they'll go there. So there were two dynamics at work. There was the altruistic dynamic and then the not so altruistic anti-Semitic dynamic, both working in concert to say, you know what, this Jewish state's a good idea for different reasons. And so the United States was behind Israel from the establishment of Israel. And here's another fun fact. When the state of Israel was first established, people in Israel asked Albert Einstein to be its first president. And I don't know how seriously he considered it. Remember, he was a professor at Princeton University at this point in history around the time I was born. You know, he died like two years before I was born. But, he, but in the 1940s, they said, hey, Albert Einstein, you're highly regarded around the world as the, probably the smartest guy on the planet. We'd like you to be president. And he spoke as if he was very honored to be asked, but, but it's not in his nature to do those kinds of things. He was not a politician. He was a scientist. So he turned it down. But, but that's the beginning. And, and, and there were a lot of, there was some migration of Jews from the United States back to Israel once the Jewish state was established. But a lot of Jewish Americans considered themselves Americans. And so that wasn't, that, that spigot didn't open up very broadly. And yes, the United States supported the Jewish state from the beginning. It was known that there would be, there would need to be some kind of defense, protective aspect of the United States' involvement from the beginning, because initially Israel didn't have an army. In fact, it wasn't even sure it was going to be called Israel at the beginning. They did, they, there was a debate as to what the name would be. But it, until Israel could stand up its own army, there was a collective United Nations agreement that the parties would collectively defend the state of Israel until it could develop its own. But the state worked very quickly to establish its own defense force, the IDF, and it wasn't more than a decade before it was able to stand up on its own. So let's bring that up to present. There was an attack at a music festival, which seemed to be let the floodgates open for what the last couple of weeks has been sued. One of the headlines that has been at the top of every news article are the tunnels and why that's such like a big deal for this conflict here. You were talking about how Palestine or Palestinians had elected Hamas as leaders. And I know that from what I've read that there are, they were misappropriating dollars and it was, were those dollars being used to build these tunnels rather than take care of the people? Is that how this kind of ties together? Absolutely. hundred percent. So the, the Hamas was getting hundreds of millions of dollars from Iran in military support. And I, and Brock, I, I think that I've been in the tunnels when I was in Israel to do some work with the IDF, they brought me into the tunnels to show me the, the extent of their problem. Beginning the mid 2000s, so for the next 15 years, it was known that Hamas was building tunnels across the border from Gaza into the area of Israel that borders the Gaza Strip. And, and the, the, probably at the time I was there, 2015, 2016, the, Israel was using ground, ground penetrating radar to detect these things. There would be occasional penetrations of Hamas terrorists into Israel, they would capture a soldier, kill a handful of people. Sometimes they were killed. Sometimes they would sneak back with the hostage through the tunnel. And Israel was dealing with these events as one-offs. I think there were probably 40 or 50 tunnels detected by the, when I was there in 2015, 2016 timeframe. And, and while they were just, they would be destroyed as Israel found them. I don't think it was clear to anybody at that time that the tunnel system was part of a larger, long range campaign plan like we would build in the United States for the defense of Taiwan, where we establish long range plans that we don't plan on pulling the trigger on, 
until something happens to cause us to pull the trigger. We, you know, I think that maybe IDF, certainly I believe that the tunnels were being used for harassment and probing, what we'll call raids, probing raids, um, it, rather than establishment of an infrastructure for a final solution, to use the Nazi expression, the final solution defeat of Israel as a state. It is now clear that Hamas had been stockpiling weapons, munitions, medical supplies, food supplies in these tunnels for probably more than a decade with Iran's support and probably Iran's, not probably, Iran's planning help. So Iran was helping them plan the campaign to defeat the state of Israel. The question would be whether the trigger, when the trigger was pulled, whether it would be coordinated attack with Hamas, Hezbollah, the uh, Islamic State, all of the Iranian proxies at once in a coordinated attack. And when the current administration says it's unclear whether Iran pulled the trigger on this attack, that's what they're talking about. Because clearly it wasn't coordinated between Hamas and Hezbollah. Hezbollah almost appeared to be surprised that Hamas initiated the attack when they did. And Hezbollah's interaction seems to be more reactive than a planned assault that's part of a greater coordinated campaign plan. Now, it doesn't mean that Hezbollah won't engage as had been planned in accordance with the campaign plan that I believe Iran did coordinate. It's just not clear that Iran said, okay, pull the trigger now. It's possible that Hezbollah, Hamas just decided, screw it, we're going for it. We're going to initiate an attack that we know Iran, uh, that we know Israel will react to. That Israel won't have a choice but to uh, react to. And we believe that Israel re will react in such a heavy-handed way that even if they have the moral high ground on day one because of the brutality of Hamas's attack, over time, they will lose the moral high ground. World opinion will turn against them and side with, quote unquote, the Palestinian people. That's an incorrect characterization. It's the Hamas people, not the Palestinian people, because Hamas has never done anything to help the Palestinian people. But the bottom line here is it, it's pretty clear that Hamas initiated this attack thinking the world would turn against Israel because Israel would react in a very heavy-handed way, what I think surprised, well, certainly surprised me. And may have even surprised them is how quickly the world turned a blind eye to the Hamas terrorist brutality. Today, there was a report of a German-Israeli model who was beheaded, and the only way they identified her was a portion of her skull through DNA analysis. And how the world's many, happily a minority in the United States, but a very vocal minority of people seem to believe that those actions were somehow justified, killing children, killing babies, killing old people, killing Holocaust survivors uh, on behalf of the Palestinian people. And, and it's just, that's an egregious point of view anywhere in the world where it exists. And it really did uncover fundamental and invasive anti-Semitism that always existed just beneath the surface that was fomented by the extreme left in the United States. And, um, and it appears in the most elite college campuses of the United States, that means it had to have professorial support. The professors were spewing this garbage in some of the most elite campuses in the United States and indoctrinating their students to believe a false narrative of anti-Semitism that just was revealed. 
It was always there. It was just revealed because this became exposed before Israel began its attacks. Immediately upon the death of 1,400 Israelis, the cruel death of 1,400 Israeli civilians. And that is inexcusable, and it is supporting terrorist activity, which is against the law, and I don't know why the government isn't acting more aggressively to stifle, because if this was Al-Qaeda support that would be fomented in the United States instead of Hamas support, there's no doubt these people would be thrown in jail. The difference is that Hamas acted against Israel, not against the United States. So somehow that's less terror. It is mind-boggling to me, and I've been gobsmacked by the extent to which this has evolved in the United States and around the world. Watching some of the news, it's nothing short of cruel. Like you said, there's the headings, the video that you had sent me and kind of prep to get up to speed as a great sermon. I'll put it in the show notes, but pastor called it Israel's 9-11, except for 30 times worse in terms of the amount of deaths per in capita, the right. population, which is just a travesty. What is it that is so confusing to our government, the universities, these professors that you're speaking about, what is up for debate when it comes to damning this clearly terroristic action versus the stance that's currently being taken? What is yeah, so what is the main point of contention? Yeah, it's pretty clear now that the that in many of the most elite college campuses in the country they've adopted what they call an anti-colonial philosophy, and it is a philosophy, it's a, a quasi-religion, that they call anti-colonial, which is, but it's really Marxist. It's anti-capitalist, it's anti-democracy. And, and they justify it based on Marxist principles of egalitarianism and, and other commonly disproved in the 20th century, disproved that these Marxist principles do not work. <laughs> They do not work in the human condition for a whole bunch of reasons that go beyond the scope of today's talk. And, and I'm a you know, physics undergrad, not a political science historian. I've had to learn history over the course of my military and civilian career. But, the, but this political philosophy that they've adopted is really a, for, a, a forgetting of 20th century Western history. It's driven by the notion that Western history and Western philosophy are, should be subordinated to other global history and, and philosophies. And of course, the whole de democratic process is a Western Greek process. The whole Republic, Republic process of elected officials is a whole Western Roman process. And if you want to believe because of your religion, that this Western set of ideals is, was fomented by a bunch of dead white guys, whether they're in Greek, Greece, 1500 years ago, or 2,500 years ago, or, or the Rome, Romans 2000 years ago, and these, these constructional governing principles upon which most Western societies were built are defects because they were they, they, they conceived of by guys like in, in later history by guys like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and a bunch of old dead white guys, then every other philosophy must be good. Now, forgetting the fact that Karl Marx was, is a dead white guy. Vladimir Lenin was a dead white guy. So it is a double standard and stupid re religion that basically subordinates 20th century history to their view of 21st century history which has no basis or foundation in historical, political, or common sense fact. It's really disheartening that it took something like this to expose what, what has been happening in some of our institutions in the United States. Now, I was protected by that for two reasons. Number one, I went to the United States Naval Academy, not Harvard, 
And number two, I would say the lot of technical, technically trained people, and, and I'm going to so say something that's going to sound harsh right now. A lot of technically pe trained people who, who majored in science, engineering, medicine, bio, those kinds of in, um, subjects weren't exposed to this philosophical nonsense that you get in a, what was called a liberal arts education. And I used to joke with my liberal arts graduate friends, this is, they, they, in theory, a liberal arts education teaches you how to think, but it didn't stick with you. And that was the harshest criticism I could give. Now I've come to believe that a non-technical college education in the wrong institution can be downright harmful. I often thought it was a waste of money because it didn't actually teach people anything that was useful in a practical sense from a vocation standpoint, from a job standpoint, to be an engineer, a coder, computer scientist, building things, doing science, medicine, helping people. I knew that it didn't teach, teach people to do any of that. But I at least believed that it taught people how to think. Now I think, now I believe it teaches, in the most elite schools in the world, a liberal arts education teaches people how to think incorrectly. So it's worse than useless. It's damaging. And, and my advice to parents all over is don't let your kids get a liberal arts education until and unless we know that the, that the standard of education improves. And I don't know if, how long that's going to take. That could take decades. If they want to go to science and engineering, fantastic. Let them do it because you really do need a college degree to learn that stuff. You can't learn it on your own unless you're Elon Musk. If you think that they're going to go to liberal arts college, it's, but you're spending money potentially to hurt your kids. And that's worse than useless. And so I think the American institution needs to rethink the value of a liberal arts education because we have so many liberal arts schools in the country, way outnumbering technical and science and, and engineering schools that I'm wondering if the pendulum doesn't need to swing back. It's sad, like you said, that it takes something this severe to expose something like that. However, if that is an opportunity for us to have greater accountability for those types of conversations, what's being taught, all of that, I, I don't want to say it's worth it. It's not like a, a tit for tat type thing, but things that kind of move us forward in the long run, I think are generally good. Where does this put us in terms of the U.S. response to this? Just two days ago, Kamala Harris was saying that there's no U.S. troops that will fight in the Israel-Hamas war. However, two weeks ago, there was a large strike on it and it, Iranian facility. We've got the Navy carriers showing a lot of activity just in the news showing up in the Mediterranean Sea as maybe typical deployment rotation. But as far as I can see it, the Navy is probably going to be front and center for this. And for it's odd that as far I've only served a very brief stint of time in the Navy, and you can probably chime in on this more, but I feel like a lot of times what will make headlines is, oh, we're not going to have any troops there, or and this isn't even just for this Israel circumstance, but in other scenarios, hey, we're not going to get involved, but we also do have a large naval presence that's knocking at their door and flying jets over daily. Where do you think that we sit in terms of our military response? And then how does the Navy factor into? I think that the administration's position on our uh, involvement is right as it pertains to Israel and worrisome as it pertains to the defense of our forces in Syria and Iraq. Let's start with the Israel aspect of it. First of all, a point can be made that, that nowhere else in the world has the United States left it up to another nation to rescue American citizens? If there are American hostages anywhere else in the world, there'd be American Special Operations Forces. It's noteworthy that 
we're holding back to the extent we are as far as rescue of American citizens that are hostages in Gaza. The presence of the United States Navy carrier strike group in the Mediterranean, and I think that's the Joe Ford Ford and the, and the Eisenhower strike group is headed towards the Persian Gulf, the Persian Arabian Sea area off of Iran is an appropriate presence. Remember, those two strike groups have profound anti-ballistic missile capability. And of course, a whole bunch of fighter jets that could respond with strikes should that need to happen. So in what scenario would we come to Israel's defense? It's important to remember that Israel is a nuclear state. Israel can defend itself quite heartily. I don't think there's any danger of Israel losing this war. But the, the old saying when it comes to battle planning is the enemy gets a vote. The campaigns that have often been easily determinable on paper, it's easy to figure out that this, this force is going to win. Sometimes that force doesn't win. Sometimes things go in a direction that you did not predict due to conditions that you didn't see coming. That's just a reality in military operations. What if Israel starts losing? What if the, the conflagration escalates with a three-front war, not just a two-front war, but a three-front war? And Israel's left with a decision to, A, risk ceasing to exist and the destruction of the Jewish people, along with the Jewish state, or B, using its nuclear weapons. What does Israel do at that point? What does the United States do at that point? The United States is left with the decision to A, allow Israel to cease to exist in the extermination of the Jewish people, B, allow Israel to defend itself with nuclear weapons, or C, get involved itself. Which of those three outcomes is the least harmful globally? So that's the scenario in which I can see the United States getting involved. Does that mean we would put troops on the ground in Israel? Not necessarily. Does it mean we might provide air support and missile defense and things like that? More likely. Does it mean we might stave off more Iranian involvement? More likely, right? So you can see there's a whole bunch of in the military planning domain we call branches and sequels as far as what the alternatives might be and what our reaction to the, each of those alternatives could be. When you're doing operational campaign planning, you plan for different branches and sequels. Start, they start with economic and political responses and they migrate to full military engagement, which we hope we never get to. But every option needs to be on the table. We can't say that the United States would never get involved. Neither should we say that we're going to get involved in this point of time. So that answers the Israel side of the, the question. I also said that the administration's reaction to the defense of our forces in Iraq and Syria is more worrisome. As we're sitting here this morning, I, I haven't checked the news in the last hour, Brock, but there have been, a, I think the most recent count is 26 attacks on American forces by Iran surrogates, Iran proxies. Those are attacks against American people, citizens, soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen. Our response was a counterattack on Iranian proxy things, not people. An am ammo dump and a supply base, something like that. If there are any people killed, it was not targeted. I don't know how impressed the Ayatollah would be over that kind of response. But history indicates he, he would not be that impressed or affected or intimidated by that kind of a response. And so I do worry that, that our reaction to protection 
of American forces in theater, American forces, not Israeli forces in theater, needs to be more robust or it won't have the intended effect. So we'll see how this develops. Let's imagine for a brief moment that you're back in the captain's seat and you're going through your branches and sequels, you're going through operational planning, battle planning, doing this whole thing again, and you've got power to be making decisions about what we're doing. What are your top priorities going into this? Let's say that you're maybe operating in the Persian Gulf or the Mediterranean Sea. What is the most important thing to you? And what assets are you trying to protect? What people are you trying to protect? And what are you looking for as a sign that maybe action needs to be taken? First thing I'll tell you, Brock, is that as a cap, Navy captain, Army colonel, Marine colonel, Air Force colonel, I did three tours in the Pentagon, one on the joint staff, two on the Navy staff, and, and guys in that and gals in that at that rank don't make decisions as it pertains to application of military forces. We develop options for the decision makers, and I was one of those guys at developing options. I did make decisions when I was Commodore on the deployment of my submarines in, res in response to orders from the decision makers. but. In the Pentagon, I, I, I d developed options, but didn't make decisions. Having said that, I think the answer to, to your question is that th there's going to be, it's going to be a difficult line to walk, but the line that has to be walked is going to be de-escalation while with, I want, they don't want to call it mutually assur assured destruction in the old nuclear warfare sense, but deterrence. So, so deterrence often requires reacting militarily. So that is the line that's going to be very difficult to walk. walk. Uh, we don't want to escalate. We don't want to be the force that causes the war to be broadened into a greater regional conflict. Right now, the Qataris are, they're supposed to be our friends. And they're acting like our friends with occasional worrisome excursions into, I, I would say, inappropriate sponsorship ship of Hamas leadership. But I think the Qataris can continue to be helpful. We don't want to do anything that causes that relationship to sour. I think the Saudis can continue to be helpful. At this point, it's most likely that the best we can expect from the Saudis is almost silence and not vigorous support for the terrorist entities, Hamas and Hezbollah. But the best I think the Saudis can do at this point is not react, not escalate. And again, we don't want to do anything that's going to cause them to think that it's necessary for them to act or speak in defense of a group of fellow Muslims. Okay to defend innocent civilian Palestinians uh, as we should as well. Innocent Palestinian civilians, not okay to defend Hamas. And throughout the region, I think the rest of our um, Arab allies are, are behaving kind of the way we would have expected. It's, you know, can't close this without pointing out for the record, both Jordan and Egypt could help the Palestinians and have elected not to do so because they're afraid, not of us, not of the Israelis, but of the terrorists, Jordan and Egypt. This is why Egypt is metering out the degree to which they're allowing people from Gaza to enter Egypt by hundreds or dozens or hundreds and not larger Palestinian populations because they know that there's no way they could sort the bad guys from the innocent if they allow large populations to migrate from Gaza into Egypt. They know that. That's not us talking. That's them talking. Jordan and Egypt can continue to be helpful. The Syrians are going to be the Syrians 
they're aligned with Russia. The Russians are going to cause trouble wherever they can. Remember, they're getting material support in the war with Ukraine from Iran, the new axis of evil. And they don't want to do anything to alienate Iran because they need those drones from Iran for the war with Ukraine. And anything that Iran does to distract the United States is better for the Russians in the war with Ukraine. The more that um, they can distract the American Congress from the support of Ukraine, the better it is for Russia. And we know where that ends, potentially with in which the United States gets pulled by NATO charter into a broader European war. This is the way it turns into World War III, by the way, is we stop our support of Ukraine. Russia starts winning, expands their European war into Moldova or some other NATO country. And NATO Article 5 is invoked, which requires us to respond to a war in Europe. And mean, meanwhile, Iran has expanded its war its war against Israel, we get pulled into that conflict. And China says, holy cow, America is so involved right now with Europe and, and the Middle East. If we're, there's no better time for us to take Taiwan and we get pulled into that, right? That's the um, horror scenario that, that could come out of this. The only way it doesn't come out of this is if we keep supporting Ukraine, right? As I said on News Nation, you know, the, the notion that we could, for a fraction of what we were spending during the Cold War to defeat the Soviet Union, a tiny fraction of what we we're supporting, spending in the Cold War to defeat the Soviet Union, we can materially degrade Russia and this emergent Soviet Union without risking a single American life. Every Congress from John F. Kennedy through Bill Clinton, through George W. Bush, would have jumped at the chance to support Ukraine. Every Congress from John F. Kennedy through George W. Bush would have jumped a chance at the chance to support Ukraine. And the fact that we're even having a debate about this is, is just mind boggling to me. And, and it's just uh, incredible. And it just adds noise to the world instability. Uh, and it's a huge problem. One that's potentially being created by our own governments instability in its support against the anti-Russian forces. As happily, the government has remained stable in its support of Israel. But it's all connected. And folks that don't realize that do not understand global geopolitics. It's all connected. The way that you have just laid out why all of these pieces are connected certainly paints it as more of a chess game rather than a checkers. It's not just as simple as supporting this group or not supporting, or do we, do we invade and do something here? There's repercussions that are extremely meaningful. Bill, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me. You've been making a bunch of news appearances and I wanna highlight those. Where is the best place for people to stay up with your analysis, news appearances, and anything else? My YouTube channel, I generally post my, my analysis that has been happening on the new news network called News Nation. It's uh, newsnationnow.com. They're trying to be an alternative to Fox News and CNN. I'm trying to be centrist. They're succeeding so far. I hope that continues. Uh, and then when they, when, I do, when they do release these little snippets that I do with them, I post them on my YouTube channel, William Toady, T-O-T-I. And I guess that's where. I'll put links to that in the show notes. Bill, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Brock. Hope this was helpful. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Your listenership helps me better educate people like you and the rest of our nation's military, both past and present, on building a successful life outside of military service. If you're looking for more ways the top vets are leading more effective lifestyles, building businesses, and using the resources designed specifically for you, press here for a selection of some of the best clips. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel to stay up to date, and I will be talking with you soon.